Hello everybody, today I'm here with Marta Costa, and I told her that I would say her name in Portuguese because it's so familiar to us. Marta, thank you for accepting the this invitation. Uh, people are going to be amazed by the work you've been doing, and probably it's not known in Brazil yet, but we are going to fix this since uh, <laughs> in this conversation, for sure. So thank you for accepting the invitation. Can you please... Uh, introduce yourself and, and talk a little bit about your journey and what makes sense having you with us for those who know you don't know you yet. Well, wonderful. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me. So uh, I have been in the sort of learning field and the leadership development field for well over 20 years, started out in Silicon Valley. And I've always liked the challenge. I've always worked with engineers and scientists and have worked in, in the space of, of uh, psychology influence, dealing with organizational dynamics, how to influence people, how to drive change. And in 2003, after working in Silicon Valley and working in Europe, I uh, started working at Los Alamos and I was the training manager for the nuclear facilities. And in 2004, uh, the, the laboratory shut down because of safety issues. And so my experience there, I mean, I didn't have a safety background, but because I was the training manager for the nuclear facilities and we did the access training, but we also had the OJT training, the on the job training. Um, and so safety was a big part of what we were training. And we would get these corrective actions. So there would be an incident and someone would, you know, the, and, and someone would come in to do an investigation. And then I would get pages and pages of, you have to train people to be better, right? You know, there was a slip, trip or fall. There was a, a small sort of sub-reportable injury. And somehow we had to figure out how to train people not to make mistakes. And that seemed absurd, right? I worked with, with Todd Conklin and um, he was he worked in the same division than I did. He was much higher on the food chain than I was. <laughs> uh, but when we had a major incident, the laboratory got shut down. And so Todd and I were part of, a, of a, an organization that was not shut down because our job was to figure out how to get the organization back in shape in order to bring it back up again and to start doing work again. And that's when we started, we read James Reason's book. We ordered tons of them, boxes of them showed up. <laughs> and uh, we learned about Sidney Decker. He'd already written his first book on error. And we, uh, we benchmarked with INPO, which is the organization for the nuclear power industry. And um, we worked with Shane Bush, who was within the, within the DOE complex. Um, he was in another facility and he had already started on this journey. And so we created what now a lot of people know from Todd are the fundamentals training. And we, our big focus was, this is ridiculous. We're looking at training and we're looking at safety as fixing the worker and we can't fix the worker. We have to fix the systems around it. And so um, that's kind of a big part of where, you know, Hop took off in the United States because, you know, uh, Todd, who's now written, I don't know, seven or eight books, has really become an evangelist for this idea. Well, I live down the street with Todd. We've stayed friends, you know, over these last nearly 20 years. And, um, and, but I, I, I went, I went in another direction. I ended up um, leaving the laboratory and working as a consultant through with Harvard Business Publishing and continuing on and doing leadership development for big corporations. Um, and, but that exposed me to, uh, I, I worked occasionally with Amy Edmondson. So, so psychological safety was in a big part of the Harvard canon. And also, you know, really starting to understand high reliability organizations, because that's something too, that comes out of that, that knowledge base. 
Um, and and now I'm 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 coming I'm back. I've I've been on Todd's podcast a few times, but now I'm really interested in this idea of building psychological capacity within organizations in order to enhance their safety systems. I realize there's a step before we we started out at at looking at it as James Reason's blame cycle, we knew that that needed to go away. But then even then we've realized that before, you know, the blame cycle is a symptom of something else, another capacity that needs to be built into the organization. Perfect, it makes all the sense. As I mentioned before, I'm working in a material that uh, pretty much I realized that to start the new view, we need to be uh, strongly uh, based on the, the fundamentals of psychological safety. So probably you guys could work in a <laughs> fundamentals of psychological safety for <laughs> as a training. And you just touched the, this this subject and Amy has become famous. Others have already uh, discussed this in, in the past, some with even this name, but she brought to the light. And my question to you is, uh, for those that are in this journey of changing and doing this changing from safety one, just to make it easier for people to know what we are talking about for the compliance and blame culture for a more open uh, situation, uh, what would be the first steps they should do to build psychological safety? Is there something that people should know before going deeply in this, this situation? I think what's really important is recognizing first, you know, the definition of psychological safety is that it's a shared belief among people. So it's a group psychological phenomenon um, that it is safe to take emotional risks. And I think one of the big changes that we haven't talked about a lot in moving from safety one to moving to a new view or to human and organizational performance view, a hop view, is that we need to look at risk. We've looked at risk in safety as something that we can eliminate and, you know, and something that we, that we need to drive down, that, that, that safety is all about preventing bad things from happening. And it's not that that's not true from one perspective, right? But the fact is that risk always exists. You can sort of mitigate for risk. The controls that you're creating are, are uh, in order to not get the, you know, in order to avoid the downfall, the downside of risk. But the very, you know, you know we have to also, I mean, safety people have to be business people too. We're, we're working in businesses. The reason why we engage in, in risky work behavior, right, and it, risky jobs is because it creates a competitive advantage and it makes money, right? The, we engage in risk in order to get the reward. We send people underground to extract minerals because those minerals are highly valuable in the market. That risk is what makes it valuable, right? That's one of the, the fact that we can manage that risk and get, and get those minerals out, that is one of the added values that the enterprise, the organization is creating. So we, we, we are in the business of, of taking risk. The thing that, that the safety professional is doing is creating capacity for risk and failure to happen without bad consequence right? So that then we can take, you know, take the benefit. So, um, so when we look at it from a psychological point of view, taking emotional risks is as important as taking physical risks um, in order to be able to understand, uh, you know, to manage the situation that's happening. So I think another foundational thing that sounds much more complicated than it really is, is that we're working in a, that all human systems, all organizations are complex adaptive systems, which means that we can't really predict 
what's going to happen. One of the fallacies in safety is that we can predict what's going to happen and therefore we can eliminate risk and then bad things are never going to happen. We can't really predict what's going to happen because in a complex system, things are emergent. Things are working together to create conditions that we aren't necessarily expecting. And why that happens is that there are systems, different systems, they call them nested systems, but basically they're systems that are in, independent and yet they influence each other. So there's the system of, um, let's say the tractor <laughs> as it works, right? That's a system and how it interacts and does its work. There's the system of the human being driving the tractor and the way that they perceive the outside world. There's the system of the overall environment where over a period of time, whether we've been paying attention to it or not, the land underneath the tractor has been degrading based on the, you know, the weather patterns that have been involved. At some point, all of those, all those systems are always interacting, but at some point, a phenomenon emerges. And maybe in this case, the phenomenon emerges that the land underneath the tractor, that that person has gone over hundreds and hundreds of times and nothing has ever happened, has at that particular moment crumbled. And now that person needs to figure out how to respond to the tractor and the land responding in a way that they didn't expect, right? And so those are the kind of capacity for dealing with the unexpected is really a very important skill for safety professionals to do, to be thinking about what sort of capacity does a person need to have or does a system need to have or does the tractor need to have in order to protect from a bad outcome because an unexpected condition has emerged? So that's an important part in thinking about complexity. The other part is that, you know, we're complex adaptive systems and Human beings are complex adaptive systems. Adaptation, adaptation is a, an adaptive system is evolution, right? And how does evolution work? Evolution works in that an organism is constantly having these mutations and things happen within us where there's all this potential to be able to respond to an unexpected change in the environment in a way that we don't even know about. You know, we might have the genes and the capacity for to regulate our body temperature, let's say, in a certain way that we never need to use in the environment that we live in. But then <laughs> all of a sudden something changes and that potential to regulate our body temperature becomes very critical to our um, to our being able to survive. And so in building psychological capacity, what we're, what, we're, what we're doing is we're building a lot of potential in different ways that we can respond to changes in the environment. And fundamentally, our responses, our actions, 90% of our actions, this is what neuropsychologists say, 90% of our actions are uh, driven by emotions. And, and I talk a lot about why that is. There's a lot of science behind that. But, but if we are able to build capacity in our emotional responses to things, then we are able to build capacity in our behavioral responses to things. And so we can to, in order to have a lot of behavioral capacity, we need to have a lot of emotional capacity, and we also need to have a lot of cognitive capacity. That is our ability to think in a lot of different ways. One of the problems with human beings, and one of the beautiful things about human beings, is that our brains create shortcuts right? We, and those shortcuts are essentially biases. Biases tend to be emotionally based, but, but what they do is they help us do things really efficiently. And so the person that's driving that tractor a hundred times along the same road, they have, they've stopped thinking about it. 
they are they are automatically doing that and because they're working with all of this expected information and so they're not using as you're not using as much of your brain when you're a not when you're a expert as you are when you're a novice. And that's really good. That means you have a lot of brain capacity to do other things and you know, to not drain yourself. Our brains are really energy hungry. And so we've evolved to be able to, if something that we do repetitively, we don't think about it as much. But, but if we get too stuck in certain thinking patterns, those thinking patterns become self-limiting because we've limited our capacity to respond to emergent, unexpected things in lots of different ways. So, to, uh, so the big things that I talk about in building psychological capacity is one, Within the organization, we need to build psychological safety. That builds psychological capacity in the organization where it becomes allowed for us to speak up, to contradict things, to act in ways that aren't sort of predictive and prescriptive, right? You know, uh, we allow people in our organization to come with our full selves and to, and to really be able to question things. And, and that questioning things is emotionally risky. Then there's the emotional resilience side of things, which means that emotionally we can respond in lots of different ways. We don't, we, we don't immediately defend against things that we don't understand or that feel threatening. And that defense kind of shuts us down from lots of different ways that we can respond. And then we build um, psych, we build cognitive, complex thinking, cognitive capacity, so that we don't, um, you know, those having something different doesn't spark our biases and keeps us from being able to see the emergent, the emergent situation. And, and that's really what happens a lot of time in our biases. It's not even that you know, it's not a choice. It's just our brains are simplifying the environment for us and then simplifying our reactions to them. And, um, and, and, in, and in complex, dangerous, risky environments, the simplest, um, you, know, using the same, you know, using the same reaction over and over again is going to get us into trouble. Wow, nice explanation. And I need to confess that I never, I had never heard about building uh, psychological capacity. I, I was always thinking about capacity, physical capacity, and then it pretty much means like redundancy or uh, resilience to support bad outcomes and, and everything. But I'm not realizing how to create this in psychological world. So uh, I, I will uh, ask you to go a little deeper and <laughs> I'm sorry for the viewers of this channel, but now I'm taking, I'm being selfish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm taking this personal, I wanna know. <laughs> uh, because no. just, just sharing a story, uh, when I was a teenager, I was kind of uh, in love for the, the most beautiful girl in the in the town, you know, so, but I had no chance, so it was, uh, not a fair game <laughs> so in the beautiful scale i was so low compared to her uh, but someday for some reason uh, she said yes let's let's go out tonight so and then i got too excited and through, throughout the day i tried to make her a surprise and i and i was crashed by a car so i had a, a, a serious accident where i oh, wow. i broke my teeth my shoulder my legs and then i, I stayed in the the intensive care for 13 days and I was like destroyed. And so I was, my, my mind was a mess, you know, so I was in the close to the best day of my life, so expected. And then I was in a, in a hospital uh, under a lot of care. And, but okay, I, I, I had her word that we would go out someday. Uh, and then suddenly someday the doctor said, there is a, a visitor for you. I said, what's her name? Who is there? And, she, and he said her name. I said, no way, don't allow her to, to come inside. I don't want to see her. I don't want her seeing me like this. Because I was like, I'm not 
handsome today. You can imagine after a car crash, <laughs> a car crash. <laughs> so uh, I, I think just uh, paraphrasing and bring this to, to today, you know, so no uh, psychological capacity to receive her pretty much. Probably she was not there because of how I look at like, she, she probably knew, you know, but in my mind, I was not able to overcome this obstacle. And I, and I think this happens in, in the companies nowadays, you know, so if you don't have this, uh, if I got it well, so I want to hear you. From, from, from no, this. I think that that's a really good example because that was a huge emotional risk, right? To see somebody who you really wanted to impress for them to see you in a very, very low point in your life. And that is exactly the sort of thing that that reason, the same kind of reason why people, if they know that there is, a problem within the organization or a problem in the operations, and it's something that they themselves are responsible for, they do not have, they do not feel like they can take the, the, the risk of saying, you know, I screwed up, you know, this isn't right. I'm worried that this problem is going to ultimately lead to a problem in some other system or down the road in the process or something like that. I mean, a real, a, a case that I talk about a lot is the Challenger case, um, the, uh, the, cha the explosion of the space shuttle Challenger um, upon re-entry into the atmosphere. And, um, and I, I, I use it because there's a great 60 minutes, um, a 60 minutes television show about it that, that interviews the people who were there and they get to the emotional aspect of this, which I think is really important. There's lots to understand from a systems view to analyze that. And David Woods, um, who I think you may have interviewed before, he really understands that case. But there's something that's really important for me. The, the, what happened was that there had been insulating foam that had been lost in multiple space shuttle launches, right? And it was small um, and they responded to it. They basically reinforced the side of the space shuttles to be able to withstand small insulating foam because that's all they'd seen before. But on the launch of the Challenger, a piece of insulating foam broke off that was far bigger than engineers had ever seen before. So this was an emergent condition. This was something that was unexpected. Rodney Roca was one of the engineers who noticed in a video, in, in, some, in some video or some pictures that were taken on launch, that that piece of insulating foam alarmed him. It seemed too big, but he needed to do more research. And he tried to get more video. He tried to get some more pictures taken. But in order to do that, NASA would have to coordinate with an other agency, and it was just a pain. And as far as they were concerned, they had years and years and years of insulating foam data. And so they denied him the chance to, to investigate this problem more. So he had already taken a risk, right, in standing up and saying, I, I need more information, and he had been told no. He continued to really be worried about it, and he had a chance in a meeting. They had a daily briefing, and Linda Ham was the woman, the manager who managed that meeting. And so they were going through, and the insulating foam thing came up. And she said, she basically said, okay, well, we've looked at this, and we've decided that there's no danger of flight, so we're not going to do anything differently here. There's no risk. And he... he was shocked by that because he knew that they didn't actually have enough data to evaluate whether or not it was a danger to the flight. And he thought about saying something and she stopped and she looked around the room as if to invite people to contradict her. It's not like she, you know, she was going to shut them down. She kind of had that sort of my open door policy right in her face, like, okay, anybody else have anything else to say about this? And he didn't say anything. He was too scared. He was scared because one of the, he, what he mentions in the video is she was up here and I was down here. 
and he had already been put down. And so I think about your beautiful girl, you are in your description, she was a 10, I was a six, right? How could I possibly, you know, it was a huge risk already for you to have asked her out. And, um, and so he didn't say anything, but it bothered him. He was very worried about it. And he wrote this long email. It was a little bit scathing. He was angry. And of course, this is what happens a lot of times when we are gripped by that fear, right? We have other emotions that come out and anger came out in his email. He showed it to his colleagues. His colleagues said, do not send this. Do not send this. This is a career limiting email. And he didn't send it. And then a few days later, the space shuttle re-entered Earth's or orbit and blew up and killed the whole crew, right? So, so it's um, because we haven't really talked about emotions in organizations enough, because we haven't, we train people to have, you know, intellectual capacity but we don't train people to have the emotional capacity it is to stand up. We think, and there's, and Leroy Kane was actually senior to Linda, Linda Han and senior to Rodney Roca. He wasn't in that meeting, but they interviewed him on 60 Minutes. And he said, Rodney Roca had in his sort of res job responsibilities, the responsibility to stand up if he thought that there was a problem that would risk people's lives. So we kind of, and it's kind of the same thing as, you know, what blame, how we think we try and institutionalize blame. We think blame's going to change people's behavior. Um, it does, but it changes it <laughs> against what we want. We kind of think, well, you know, what we can do is we can create an administrative control. That's, you know, the safety word. We can, we can just say everybody has to behave this way. Like you have to speak up. It is your, you are accountable to it, right? We go to accountability and we think accountability is going to drive people to behave. But if we don't have a true understanding of the psychology of emotions and how that drives our behavior, we can tell people all day that they're accountable to take risks and they're not going to do it. It has to be, it has to be meaningful for them. And human beings take huge emotional and physical risks all the time. And what drives them is, is, is meaning, is, is this is something that's worth doing. And even if, I mean, and, and bravery is even if um, I have a chance of being rejected or even if I have a chance of being punished, I know what's right and I'm going to do that. But that takes a very exceptional person. And we can't expect like to hire the most exceptional. We, we don't even, we have started measuring people's emotional intelligence in hiring people, but that's just ridiculous to think that we're going to hire people to have emotional capacity. We need to think about how we're going to develop people to have emotional capacity. Yes, and, and that's my next question because pretty much those transitions for, for the new view uh, in the companies are being uh, led by safety professionals that uh, I'm one and I'm, I'm putting myself uh, under fire here. I don't consider myself the, the correct person to to develop or to build. I can try to foster with the leaders, but I'm guessing that it's a leader uh, accountability to develop and to create an environment where people can be open and, and everything. Am I right? Are we delegating the, the, this accountability for the wrong people in the company? Well, I mean, I think we also have to recognize that you really are a leader if you're an influencer. I don't want any safety professional to think that they're not a leader because they are. You influence processes, you influence people, and you can build your sphere of influence. You know that in order for something to change, you need to have people with power in the organization in order to drive it. But then it's really up to you to develop those people with power as allies. 
But, you know, that also requires you understanding them and their motivation and creating for them uh, a narrative, a meaningful narrative that they recognize that it's worth taking that risk as well, right? So, um, so in every interaction that we have, whether it's two people, whether it's five people, whether it's a formal team that works together, whether it's the organization, in every situation we have to create psychological safety where people feel comfortable. And one of the big things, and Amy Edmondson talks about this, is, is developing that shared sense of purpose. And that shared, shared, you can say that, you know, develop a shared sense of purpose, but that really, you have to kind of understand how purpose happens in people's minds. You know, there's a, there's some, the emotion has to be attached to that purpose, for, that an emotion that everybody shares. And then there has to be some ideas, some thoughts attached to that purpose that will drive action, some rules. So, and, and the, you know, that emotion thought, connection is just really important in our minds. It's simple, but it's an important driving factor for us. You know, because, you know, because we love our country, right? Or because we, you know, we um, want to achieve this and there's gonna be some love or some passion behind that. We know that we need to do something this way. This is the, the thought is sort of the rule of action. You know, in every case, we are going, uh, you know, whenever we, I'm trying to think of a good example. Um, you know, whenever we encounter a situation where we don't know what's happening, then we are going to investigate further. We are a, com a company that is curious. We are curious about the unknown. You know, that could be a driving meaningful way for people to understand how they're going to integrate the new view into their safety practice, right? Because we care about people's lives, <laughs> because we have families too, that's emotionally charged we're going to be curious about the unknown, right? Yes. And that's gonna drive, that sort of thought is going to drive a lot of different behaviors. Then pre-job briefs, post-job briefs, learning teams, all of those practices that come out of HOP, they make a lot of sense. They are not just empty actions. You know, they're not just check the box activities. And that's the problem with any program if any program that doesn't have purpose behind it becomes a check the box program, it started with every great intention. And yet it gets, the intention gets lost because the meaning gets lost. Yes, perfect. I totally agree. And that's what I, uh, you, we mentioned the, the diversity and the the openness before, uh, and that's what I try to do in my zone of uh, power. Let's put like this, you know. I, I try to, of what's under my 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 responsibility. I try to develop this, and and, and this works well, you know, because when you are the, the people with the most influence in the in the situation, you you are the accountable for creating this environment when people can. Can be open, you know, can take risks, and, and but Marta, my question is: Is this uh, situation measurable? Can we know that a company has a good level of psychological safety? Uh, is that possible? To don't don't do too much spoiler because uh, <laughs> I know that's your job. But can we know that we are needing to develop or to build psychology because? That's something that I always see, you know, for, for the new view, for psychological safety and for everything. When you present something to other people or to other companies, they say, we already have that. So, <laughs> but you know from your heart that it's not true, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's one thing that I talk about a lot that one thing that I think is problematic in ways that people are talking about psychological safety now is that they think they can build a culture of psychological safety within an organization. And to some extent, sure, yeah. But the fact is that psychological safety is not something that is a given. It's not something that you create and you know you, you, you set it and you forget it, right? It, it's, 
it's something that is very, very fragile. And every time a new group of people get together or conditions, emotional conditions change around an existing group of people, psychological safety is destroyed. So psychological safety is something that needs constant maintenance. And I believe that that's the job of the leader of that particular, you know, interaction or the, or the, you know, the key influencer in that particular action, or if it's a self-directed team, sort of everybody needs to be aware of it. So, so psychological safety is not something that you put posters on the wall. I mean, you know this about safety too, like safety culture is the idea of thinking about that can be um, dangerous because you think you put, you put posters on the wall. We have a safety culture. Everybody gets this. We've got the t-shirts. You know, this is the kind of culture we have. The, the problem with culture is that it's not adaptive. I mean, the very definition of culture is that it's, it becomes subconscious. It's the way we do things around here and we're not thinking about it. Well, that goes straight in the face of a complex adaptive system, right? We culture, we need to be adaptive. We need to be able to change our culture all the time. We need to be able to change the way we behave all the time. The, well, this is the way we do things around here is actually rather dangerous and reducing capacity. So I, I'm kind of not a big fan of talking about things with respect to culture. Although I do understand that there's lots of benefits. It's like a, you know, it's like bias, really. It's really great when things are all the same, right? It helps us be very, very efficient and effective in, in performance. But if we are dealing with emergent conditions and a lot of change, like we are all dealing with right now in the world, then it can be problematic. But we go to the ghost back to your question, how do we see psychological safety? I created a list of 10 things that, you know, I got from you know, a lot of different reading of different people, you know, Amy Evanson, of course, and she's popularized that idea and taken a really interesting take on it. It's, it's an older, it's not a brand new idea and she doesn't claim to have invented it. Um, and it looked at a lot of different cases. And I also have spent a lot of time in innovation, like working in companies with innovation and diversity and inclusion and all of those pieces. And I came up with a list of 10 things that are observable. And like one of them is expectations are openly discussed. Uh, leaders admit fallibility. That's one of the things that Amy Evanson talks about all the time. Um, intellectual conflict is encouraged. These are all things that we can observe, right? Leaders can observe, or you can observe in your interaction and you can say, yeah, you know, um, failure, people are hiding their failures. People aren't recognizing failure as learning. We're not dealing with psychological safety here. Um, you know, healthy emotional boundaries aren't set. That's another thing. You know, boundaries are important too. Healthy emotional boundaries where people can say, look, <laughs> this is bothering. I, you know, I, I can't deal with this right now, right? People being able to stand up for themselves emotionally is also showing that there's psychological safety. It doesn't mean, psychological safety does not mean that everyone's feeling great and happy and everyone's getting along. You can have that condition and there'd be no psychological safety. Nobody is willing to take emotional risks. Nobody's willing to speak up. Nobody is willing to contradict the expert, right? Everybody, but everybody's getting along, right? And that's not actually what we want. Um, that's not, you know, I think in order to deal with emergent situations, getting along isn't a big value. I mean, of course you can have um, emotional conflict, right? L the kind that's destructive, but, but it takes uh, an emotional risk on the part of a leader to address um, destructive emotional conflict, right? So I think I have as one, one thing on the list is emotional conflict is addressed, but intellectual conflict is encouraged. So there are things that we can see. And I have done research in this. I've did, I did research on one particular psychological phenomenon that is usually very emotionally distressing for people in organizations, specifically in safety. And I measured, you know, 
um, emotional well, emotional our ability to manage our emotions emotional from emotional intelligence and cognitive complexity so our, our ability to look at things from lots of different perspective and see how that impacted how defensive people got in this difficult um, um, uh, this difficult situation this the this difficult psychological phenomenon and and it's not worth talking about it here but it was it was um, psychological paradox it's just something that arises in really volatile situations so what i found actually is that managing your emotions is very important and manage and this complex thinking is actually important but it only important in the in the presence of emotional management <laughs> so so we can't avoid emotions anymore i mean we could say oh well you know we we do critical thinking skills you know Th this is real and the absolutely critical thinking skills are important but you can't do critical thinking skills well without emotional management skills and that was one of the things that my study showed master class <laughs> <laughs> so master. i do I, yeah, so I am, so psychological capacity is, you know, it's, I, it's basically a synthesis of a lot of things, and I'm currently writing a book on psychological capacity, and the way that I'm writing the book is that I created a, a three-part class for everybody on these things, you know, and, uh, and, and I'm seeing how people are responding to it. I'm trying to, you know, I, I get so stuck in, like, my research sometimes and I need to kind of take it out to the world and see how it really works in the real world and so right now I'm doing the three-part class with some really smart people and um and I'm learning a lot about what makes sense to people and what doesn't make sense to people one of the key things and I learned this from Todd in writing a book is to know what not to include so that it makes sense to people and sometimes if you've been a scholar in a field for a really long time, you don't know what not to include, right? Because it all makes sense to you, but it doesn't make sense to anybody else. So, um, so that's kind of what I'm doing right now. I, I'm, I'm introducing this idea of psychological capacity based on, you know, the idea of safety capacity, you know, as part of safety capacity. And um, I've always been a trainer. I mean, I've always worked in development. So what matters to me is not so much the, the theory, is the practice. So I'm, we're working out lots of different ways for people to practice this rather than just think about it. Perfect. So uh, our time is, is gone already. And now I realize why Todd put you in the first and the second episode from his podcast, because you have a lot to say. Uh, thank you for accepting all uh, again. And I want you in this final uh, minutes to tell people where they can find you to, to get help with all this brand new stuff for us down here in Brazil. I think you we need a second session as well. <laughs> and uh, we are going to realize somehow a way for uh, you to make your, your work available for, for Brazilians in Portuguese, in Spanish. Somehow people need to know what you, you are teaching for sure. As soon as I write my book, I will definitely um, tap you to translate it into <laughs> Portuguese. Deal. Um, absolutely. I was so impressed with what you did with Todd's um, book. Uh, so I have a website um, and it would be easy for Brazilians to remember. It's just martica.com, M-A-R-T-I-C-A.com. And I, it's just because I had that domain for a very long, I got it when I, when I was uh, 20 years old in, in Silicon Valley. Um, and so that's my, that's my website. So you can go there. Um, and it, and, and that has a lot of, res I've, I've put up a lot of resources. I put up videos of different um, speeches I've given, the podcast that I've done with Todd, and then you can sign up for classes that I'm offering to the public there. I'm just, I've always worked within corporations, um, you know, sort of worked, you know, set up programs within a corporation for them. 
but uh, the safety community is so, it's just a wonderful community. And Todd really encouraged me to have a, a class available to everybody so that we could start socializing this idea. Perfect. Be ready to be famous in Brazil. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you, Marta. Thank you so much, Hugo. It's wonderful, wonderful talking to you.